Guten Morgen, Werner, und willkommen zur .NET API Review. Today's language is brought to you by Norwegian. Hopefully. Or, you know, something close enough to it. All right, first up, a marshal marshaler for the Olay variant, 89er543. So, as we have learned through our work on the com source generator, a lot of people still use the variant type from common OLE. So we need to provide some semblance of support for it in the source generator, and we wanted to provide support that we can kind of layer it that like in, we provide kind of a nice type for for groups like WinForms to build their own marshalling on top of, and then we'll provide a set of default rules that are a subset of what the runtime supports, and we'll grow to at most as what the runtime supports. But then cu consumers can still build their own wrappers around it. So we have a type here that has some basic logic, it's the OLE variant. The It will have private fields that lay it out to match the native variant type exactly so that this type itself is blittable. It will be disposable so that you can, it will call variant clear or prop variant clear to free all the memory in it. We will have a create raw method that basically lets you fill in the raw data member and you give the variant type. We will have a generic create method that depending on the T will set, will determine the var enum type and determine the underlying raw value. We have a static constant for, for a VT null variant because VT null variants are weird and different than VT empty. Then we have the as method, which matches with the generic create method. And then we have a var type and get raw data ref members that correspond to the create raw method. And then the marshaler implements the basic marshaling managed, unmanaged, unmanaged, to managed. And then the ref propagate nested marshaler propagates a value back for a VT ref, so a ref variant. Since a variant can actually be a ref to the underlying data instead of just containing the data itself, yeah. including being a ref to another variant. Sorry, like I think I missed the 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 original motivation. You said it's for source generation, but like why? Do I mean we don't have a type for variant in the platform at all, or right? we have it either as in PTR or as object, I suppose most of the time. So why do we need a dedicated type for this now? So, firstly, we need a type to put in the signature. For if you're marshaling from object to variant, we need a variant type to put in the signature, and we would prefer to not have to emit a variant type as a file scope type into every single compilation. Additionally, WinForms needs to manipulate variants. They already have their own variant type that they pulled from CS132 and they have since wrapped in their own logic. We've we've talked with them and confirmed that they could move over to using our OLE variant type instead of using the CS132 type and share some of the logic so, and build on top of our logic. So when you, when you say we need it for this signature so the, i guess that's my question why can't the signature be object or in ptr because the native sig the unmanaged signature that we'll put into the function pointer call or the no marshalling p invoke or the unmanaged callers only has to have the struct type that has the shape and if we introduce the ole variant marshaller which follows the pattern of how we've introduced all of our other marshallers then we need to have the underlying type introduced we could just have a dumb type that just has the layout of variant and has no other logic around it. But that means so that is... anyone who wants to build on top of it has to build all of the logic themselves. I see. So is it fair to say then you need this for declaring effectively the PNBOX signature? So it's not for the managed side, it's for the native side that you call into to have this? Yes. And then we and then we provided a we wanted to provide a nice API surface on top of the OLE variant type instead of just exposing all the native members so that we can provide that sort of structure as like the way you're intended to look at it and also provide an API that WinForms could build on top of instead of them having to layer on top of it a nice API service themselves and then we'd have to do the same because our, our plan is to also use this type in the places in the runtime where we have variant 
or at least consider doing that. So any support that we have in the runtime for com events, the DLR support for interacting with com, that uses all that's variants all over the place. We'd like to be able to use this type as the variance type that we use throughout all the different locations. And then like in your example, like you have this public static partial bar that uh, takes an object X. Uh, why would it take an object X? Why would it not take an all E variant at that point? Which one? In your API usage example, like you, you, so, you declared this public static yes. partial bar so, using the Marshall so that's on the So that's on the library import with the Marshall <clears throat> using. So then the generated code would use the OLE variant Marshaller and have the OLE variant type in the signature. Whereas the first set of examples is using the OLE variant type directly. So, so the first one is if you're manually manipulating variants. The second one is if you are using the Marshaller to provide an experience similar to the prior P invoke experience. Gotcha. So they're basically just different use cases. So you would not expect yeah. people to parse in an instance of all the variant as the object. You would literally expect them to parse in you know, an end or a string directly, right? Yes. The scenario for object. So the OLE variant marshaller would encapsulate the mm -hmm. ex an experience similar to Marshall as unmanaged type struct on an object parameter in built-in interop. The, and then, so we'd expect people to use that. If we were to build like an iDispatch <coughs> based source generator, we'd expect to have a different type of marshaller that would use the generic, that would call directly onto the generic types in OLE variant. Or if someone wants a different policy for what runtime types map to what members Invariant. For example, if someone wanted to implement support for com records, which we are pl not planning on supporting because .NET, modern .NET doesn't support it, that's a .NET framework only feature. We could say you write your own marshaller, and then you would use the create raw method on OLE variants to implement the underlying behavior that you want. Okay. That makes sense. Thanks for explaining that. Like that, that was the context that I think that, that I did not take up from just reading the description. Have we put nested types in any of the other marshallers? Yes, we have. Usually, this, so all the other ones that we have done nested types of, it is uh, the nested type corresponds to one marshall mode. So when we've had like the UTF-16 string or UTF-8 string marshaller, we've had a nested type managed to unmanaged in that corresponds to the managed to unmanaged in marshal mode. This is the first nested nested type in a marshaller that corresponds to multiple marshal modes. Now what's interesting here is there's also the fact that this marshaller needs to be special cased in the generator anyway because even for the managed to unmanaged in mode we need to use the managed to unmanaged ref shape to get the correct behavior so we'll need to have some affordances in the generator to detect this scenario Do you have some sample code of what the the generated code looks like of these things? No. For this generator, for this one we've just done the API proposal. We haven't like gone and pre-implemented it. Gotcha. But I can I can pull up some examples of existing source generated code. I think got it somewhere. Yeah, I was more curious like what the uh, what the tie -in is to the OLE variant, I guess. Like, I think the the Marshall one never kind of makes you remember how we how this looks like. Yeah, so the implementation for the Marshaller, basically the Marshaller provide would provide a policy of given the runtime type, so it would do the object.get type, and then it would do if that type is equal to type of whatever, call mm -hmm. OLE variant create of that same type. Just all the way down the list. 
Right. Is how they'd end up doing it. And that's basically the defining the matching policy, where OLE variant says, I will go based on compile time type and be very straightforward on that. The marshaller says, I'll go based on runtime type for the matching experience. Yeah, that makes sense. The OLE variant create method, uh, it's generic with no restriction. Do really all types work in it? Or is it just hard These, to describe to the it is, language what it, types work? We'd have to like have all of the primitives and each of the interop services wrapper types. And it's it's very difficult to describe all of the types that would be supported. We'd have to have some like marker interface that we just drop everywhere across the product. Okay. Yeah. So a lot of things are going to type or are going to fail, but it's not a, is it a fixed list or is it extensible by behavior? It, this one is a fixed list. So if we wanted to, if we implement the, we could design this such that if we wanted to introduce an interface that we just drop across all the types, we could. That's like OLE variant supported type, and then that has the var enum that's associated with it, and then a like two OLE variant method across just all of the different types. So it would be across all of the primitives, the wrapper types, uh, I'm trying to think what else. Those are the ones off the top of my head. I'm venturing, I guess, and say you don't want that. It's the same problem that we have today, but never we have a constraint because a lot of the code that uses it is already generic, and again, constraint there will be breaking. And so, if we introduce a new method that takes a constraint, very often you find yourself not being able to use it, even if your T happens to satisfy that constraint practically, right? Right. I mean, the alternative yeah. when we have, you know, only a handful of T's that work, is just overloading and saying there's a create mm. that takes an int to create that takes a un to create that takes a you know etc if this was general api i would say that's the shape that we should go but since this is marshalling i probably care less about having a thing that looks like an open generic that's really a very very limited closed generic yeah like if we let me pull up the Yeah, so there are, so it'd be all the primitives, um, date, time, string, uh, decimal. Mm -hmm. And actually, decimal you can't technically do because it maps to two different things depending on what you want. Um, then all the different wrapper types. And then uh, uh, void star, which you can't implement interfaces on and you actually can't call it with generics either so that'd be int ptr calling the create raw method instead yeah like we could if we wanted to it's ba basically most of what implements i convertible ends up yeah. fitting in here pretty well plus the system runtime interop services wrapper types like unknown wrapper dispatch wrapper error wrapper yeah, yeah. so it's i mean it it's close but like I don't know if it's worth dropping something there, especially because you have at least one case that maps to multiple. In particular, decimal mapping to both decimal and currency. Yeah. I think you don't want this. I think the... Um, I think the, the thing what you want here is you want something relatively simple and scoped, right? I think the problem in practice yeah. with, 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 with this whole com stuff is that it's so, you know, it's kind of fixed, but also open ended enough that it's painful, right? And yeah. I don't think you want to pollute the, the, the primitives with some sort of marker interface, like even if the constraint would be something we could do, uh, it just seems ugly. Yeah, if we, if we were to have some sort of constraint, I would want to wait for a language feature where we could define where we define OLE variant, like here's the constraint, and then this, and then say like this type implements the constraint with this, this type implements the constraint with this, and like the roles extension sort of model. Right. But 
in the meantime, like every everything in Marshall that deals with variant is already just typed object. Even just having a strongly typed generic is already a massive improvement. So you're not like boxing ints everywhere. Yeah. How yeah. does this work with the with the SQL ones? Probably not at all, right? Because which the ones? Wrong layer. Like, don't don't we have this like uh, the, so SQL has the, has their own types, right? SQL in SQL flow, blah blah blah, right? Um, and I thought there was a a variant as well, but maybe I'm missing. Yeah, so there's a so there's a SQL variant, I think. Yeah. And that is different. That is a different type, as far as I know. Yes, because that can store into binary and char. It's just and they that's... use the same name, but it's their own representation of a of a union type, right? That is under yeah. it's the OLE one. Yeah, so that's why I wanted to name this OLE variant because a variant <laughs> type is a common enough name across experiences that yeah, I wanted that to sense. tighten this down to the scenario that actually uses it, and then that way we can say, oh, you want the OLE variant because you're interacting with OLE com stuff. There you go. Yep. That makes sense. But yeah, I certainly wouldn't recommend the constraining interface approach. Uh, in particular, if you know somebody slapping it on their own type, it wouldn't make it just work. Um, but the making like 15 overloads of create isn't outside the you know realm of reasonable but again at the as a marshalling feature i don't care as much as if this was i don't know vector of t like yeah the reason that i wanted to have it generic was then we have the pairing between the generic create and the generic as and it's the same type supported in both and you just kind of have a nice mirroring structure there mm -hmm. but if we wanted to do all the overloads we could. It just would be a lot of overloads of create. Yeah, it sounded like 15 or so, which is yeah. on the one hand, a lot, and on the other hand, not a lot. And in a trim thing, all the ones you didn't call would go away. So, But yeah, I... It bothers That's me like epsilon. Question. So, Do we care about this from a linking standpoint? Presumably, like, once you use all of them, any of them use all of them, right? There's really no. So we, I guess we generally don't yeah. care for primitives, right? Yeah, if I, I so if you're using the type itself, if you're using OLE variant itself, I think yeah. it might actually. So linking, it's going to be so little code. I don't think it matters because it's basically going to be like checking the if type and then checking and then like one or two lines of code, mostly like assigning the var type and then calling one or two methods and then like maybe like the only cases where it's going to call a method is like decimal or the com object types uh the other case would be and then like if you're looking through the marshaller you can object anyway so you're going to have runtime types so you're not going to be able to trim it anyway and most scenarios we expect from non win forms would be using the ole variant marshaller and then win forms is probably going to just end up having so much other logic around it because they take an object that turn into variants for dealing with accessibility and stuff like that. It doesn't matter either. Everything is going to end up being kept because too many people use object for variant. And in terms of naming, like, have you considered com variant? I thought about com, but I decided to use OLE because the variant type is technically defined in the OLE automation ITIL files as compared to, like, the base com definitions. Yeah, it's like it's all it's in the O the OA IDL H file and it's OLE aught thirty two for the library. So I was thinking it's more in the OLE subset than the greater com definition. You're you're muted, Emo. 
the the only reason I'm saying this, the new one you put it in, the Marshall namespace, it's you know moderately clean, if that's the thing to say about interop. Um, and you don't use the word OLE anywhere right now, but you use the word COM already. But yeah, I don't actually have strong opinions on this. We could name it COM. There's not another variant type you'd ever use in COM. Right. But it's just a big old variant. <laughs> Yeah, if you look if you look up like variant com or com variant type, then the Wikipedia page is named variant type parentheses com, and then if you go to common uses, it's always mentioning OLE automation. So it's really whatever we feel is the best fit. That's It was funny to hear David right in the background. Yeah. Yep. Um, I, I have a, a silly question regarding that um, Git ref T uh, API near the bottom of the proposal. Uh, yes. Git raw data ref. Um, is that it, is that going to be like a properly aligned T because it fits within the variant? Is that the idea? Yes. So okay. basically, like the structure of variant there's so it's a union on the top between decimal and then like some fancy like basically matching the layout so that like the flags that aren't used in decimal are used to describe the type of variant so it's decimal and then the rest of the structure and then in that one it's the variant kind and then a union of all of the other types of members you can put in a variant so this would just be a ref to the start of that union okay that perfect, has yeah. all the other options and then this way we can make it generic and instead of having a like as int 32 as in 64 set in 32 set in 64 for every single option we can just have a git raw data ref and a var type and then it'll you can check the var type and then get the data ref to the exact shape that you want to put the type in uh, the, the, the data that you want to put into the variant exactly the way that you want it to be yeah per perfect I, the, the reason i ask is I, I was going to say if if it weren't aligned, then I would prefer for that to be a ref byte and then force the caller to use like unsafe dot read unaligned. But yeah, this this will work then. So does it mean if I create a, a <clears throat> normally variant out of a, a long, I can call get data get raw data ref for int? Yes, <clears throat> because that's just it gets you the ref to the data. And then that's your problem that you're reading the wrong variant member. If you're basically if you're using git raw data ref, that means we're trusting that you're checking the var type first. The only thing we right. validate is that you're not reading out of scope. Right. So if I store an end and ask for long, that's a bug. But if I store a long and ask for an end, that's fine. You just get you know the lower yeah. thirty-two bit or something. Yeah. Yeah. Actually, like if you store in and ask for long, that's also okay. We're just going to give you the garbage. It's if you were to store something and then try to read something that's larger than the fair than the data union member so if you were to try to read like a 40 byte struct out of the with git raw data ref that would read you past the end of the variant oh i see what you're saying so you're not actually verifying the size of the type you're just verifying the size of the of the union which happens to hold up to long right or whatever it is yeah yeah so basically, we're making sure that as long as you, we're, we're basically the only thing we protect against is out of bounds reading. If you read yeah. the wrong member of the variant, you're reading the wrong member of the variant. Check the var type. Yeah, that makes sense. So the the get raw data ref can't change the variant type. So presumably nothing super very bad happens if somebody calls get raw data ref on the null singleton and then write something that's not zero there? Yeah, so if, when you actually set it to VT null, it doesn't actually care about the member. Okay. VT null actually ends up... So VT null is basically like, if you set the type to VT null, there's no members that matter, and then the managed value for VT null is actually the DB null constant, which is 
we're going to preserve that for back compat because VT empty corresponds to null. And I know this is sad, and I know everybody's sad about it, but I don't think we can change that without really screwing up like exper the experience. Yeah, just I was just thinking because we're we're give giving the ref and so that you can write back to it. I was just making sure we didn't asking if we needed to have guards that stopped it from being used on the null. And it sounds like it in a well-behaving application, it shouldn't matter. Yeah. And var enum already exists, right? Yeah, var enum is an existing type, which ends up being useful. If you're willing to accept this modem, use the TP all of us. Basically, have that data. Um, yeah, this. I, I'm, I'm still. Uh... <laughs> I'm still like wrapping my mind around a disposable well, yeah, truck. But none of this yeah. Is um, if you're willing to accept the yeah, it's disposable. the disposable is basically like there's already the free method on oh yeah. there's the free methods on the marshaller and like we're just gonna call the underlying method to free the variant, so we might as well put it on the variant so that because we're not exposing the we're not exposing the nested members anyway, this way we handle the disposing, especially cross-platform. Yeah, yeah, yeah. Because no no one is ever going to call this in their own app, right? Like you're doing this through a, a generator or something. So OLE variant people might use, like WinForms is going to use it. If we update the DLR to use it, then we'd be manually using it there. The com event support and the runtime might end mm -hmm. up using it. But yeah, like it's it's meant to be like this is meant to be kind of the building block that you build other stuff on for people to use. So unless you're actively like set building a system for projecting com into your experience, you wouldn't be using this type. Yeah. Yeah. And, and that makes sense. Um, if, cause it, it, it's one of the things that we try to guard against normally, and maybe this is a special case, um, as you mentioned, is like people disposing of something twice. And it's very easy to dispose of a struct twice because caught by valve. Um, if you have a ref to the struct, then you're only going to dispose it once. But yeah, if if you're not necessarily concerned about callers um, incorrectly using dispose by and large, then I'm not either. Yeah, I'm not particularly concerned about it. I think that if you're using this type directly, you're going to be passing it around like you would if you were writing in C++. Yeah, yeah, yeah. Okay. Um, a thing that I noticed and started doodling, um, because it is by design a mutable struct, um, the non-mutating members we should be good and paint as read-only. So I think this, but this is the syntax I use a lot, so I think it's public read-only t, and then on the property I think it's read-only get. Okay. Yeah. But whatever makes the compiler happy. <laughs> yeah. That doesn't make VS Code happy. Is it over here? Yeah. yeah. Wherever it goes. But I thought that we'd only went on the right side, but maybe I'm wrong. Yeah, I don't remember. <clears throat> the best place to somewhere. put it is right there. But we've uh, this one intentionally can't. So, yeah, yeah, because we need to be able to write back if necessary. Right. But if you happen to have one of these from an in or whatever, like mm -hmm. this shouldn't cause a copy to be made. So, painting okay. the read only is goodness. Yeah. Great. All right. Uh, so, emo, you brought up. OLE versus COM. How much do you see ARE? I don't actually that care that much. It's just the only place that we use that phrase in the new namespace now. So I thought, you know, I'm okay with using it. I just wanted to point it out and say, now, if you want to keep it somewhat cleaner, <laughs> then you could. But I, I don't actually care super strongly. 
So just comparing the examples of what you get when you search com variant versus OLE variant on, well, Bing, because that's my default search engine on my work machine. For when you search com, you get the Wikipedia page. And then now I'm getting the variant header definition. Beforehand, I was getting just like VB6 variant type, which didn't give me much information about the underlying structure. And then I get documentation on common or up and .net. When you search OLE variant, the first thing you get is the header definition and then the structure definition for Win32 apps. And then you see and then a few other places that use the name OLE variant. In particular, it looks like Embacardo uses OLE variant in their for Delph for their Delphi and C projections for yeah. their libraries. And then Perl also uses OLE variant, okay, I, I guess. And so does, actually, here's another one. The uh, CS win, this, the, the, win, the win, the win, the win 32 RS, the, the rust projection of the Windows SDK mm. uses OLE variant. Well, they, they put the variant type in the OLE namespace. I think. They have well, it's yeah. 132 system variant, and then they have like all the rest of the variant types are in OLE. So it's not even under system com. Yeah. I mean, it, it, to me, they're equally fine. Um, I agree with you that we should not use the name variant by itself because we might want to use this for something else. And it seems too generic. Um, hmm. So yeah, p pick the one you like. OLE variant is fine with me. Yeah, OLE sounds more appropriate based off of the being relevance that you were citing. Okay. Yeah, Whee. I'm a little sad that the design that we have so far for the Marshall mode says you have to special case this one. We could alternatively, instead of saying for in and ref, we could make this unmanaged to manage ref and special case it differently instead of naming it ref propagate. We can also try to come up with it. We can also, like, I guess, approve the variant type and then come back on the marshaller trying to come up with a better way to represent this so that it's not just special, so it's not special case. But also, I don't know if we want to. Yeah, I mean, I'll be honest and say it's all kind of below my carrying bar right now. So, Yeah, like, this particular scenario is something that we've tried our best to not support. Like, the pass in something by value, manipulate the contents of it, and then just say it's that same value going out. Yeah, I would say, like, give it some thought. I mean, there's arguments in both directions, right? Like, one argument is if you need to special case, it might indicate that you don't have the right... Um, expressiveness at that layer but then for core types like variant and others sometimes your type system just does something really special that you don't really want to generalize anyway so you're better off just special casing it so you don't have to leak all that complexity so yeah, where the, your stuff yeah. flies in i don't know like but i think it's probably worthwhile just thinking about it yeah this is the second case mm. of it we have like arrays with the in and out attributes and I guess this is the second case that we've hit with this sort of experience. Right. And the difference with this one is we'd have to detect it has it's based on the mode of the variant. We can't just have it in the signature and say like if you right. pass in a VT ref variant and you don't specify that you want it marshaled out, then we'll just not. We need to actually like do the correct behavior. Yeah. Yeah, I mean, give it some thought, and then if you want to change it, 
you know, come back. Otherwise, just leave it as is. That's fine too. Thank. You. Okay. All right. I think we've talked this one to death. To approval, you mean? Yeah. Same thing. So then, uh, what was the next one? Yeah, this one. All right. Provide a configurable overload of memory cache entry options for the commonly used method get or create in memory cache extension. 92101. That was a lot of words. Who can explain this one? I think this was supposed to be Adam, but Adam is out. Forgot about that. Yeah. Consider support for iParsable of URI on URI. 92285. Should I speak to it? If you know something about it. Yeah, uh, sure. I found this. Uh, yeah, uh, mostly like strings, URIs, their friends, uh, like other types in the framework, uh, support type parsable daytime and stuff like that. And like, mm -hmm. I just realized that URIs do not, and uh, in SP.NET or form binding logic, uh, essentially recognizes site parsable. So we need to not right now a special case uh, system URI. Uh, for uh, for doing mapping and like we just rather want to like have Not that go bad. through I parsable. I mean that makes perfect sense to me. I mean that was what the interface was supposed to represent. So yeah, we should just yeah. edit. Yeah, I don't it know might be worthwhile said... just doing a scan across the framework and see what other types we have that have a. A parse and a two, a, a parse and try parse, or just a parse and see which other ones would be in this category. But um, I can, I am, I'm happy to do that. Although this one doesn't actually have a parse today, right? It has a create. Yeah, try create. One, but one th interesting... Your point stands, Emo. We could we could scan for multiple kinds of words and see what we find. Yeah, yeah. An an interesting thing about URI dot try create is that uh it it takes options, required options, not just the uh, string input. Um, right, we'd, have to choose, a... we'd have to choose one. I think, Miha, you're on the call, right? Yeah. Yeah. Be because there is a constructor that just takes a string, I assume iParsable would just follow whatever logic the constructor does. Um, but in, in general, we would probably uh, we would probably not want to add iParsable to anything that has mandatory options. Um, but yes, yeah, so, so not URI should be fine. Yeah, with URI, the default, um, so just the constructor, which you can just pass a string to it, you don't have to give it any other options, that'll default to only accepting absolute URIs. Whereas with try create, you're forced to do it. The proposal here wasn't actually to follow the default constructor. Um, so it wasn't to do only absolute, it would be to also allow relative URIs. Right? So it would be closer to a try create with absolute or relative. That is the issue here, right? We need one default, essentially we have no configurability here. Exactly. And that's what we use since like 6.0 and minimal APIs is try create with relative or absolute. Otherwise, it just uses the iParsable stuff for most other types. ASP.NET aside, Miha, is relative or absolute what you would choose for this with no other information? Personally, yes. Uh, I put a small caveat in the issue. Um, like a few years back, we approved an API that we haven't fully implemented yet, but uh, essentially giving you an option to not allow absolute file paths as input. Right? So if you do slash foo, 
that's a weird case with URI today where that will be a relative URI on Windows, but an absolute file path on Unix. And that's usually something that just bites people in the ass because they don't realize it and it's not what they intended to do. And most likely if we add the option to turn that off, we would choose that as the default um, when URI was created. Um, and for this API, right, we can choose to make that the default behavior since we have to choose a default anyway. It's just a matter of how much we want to match existing constructor factory methods or what people might expect if they just parse strings. Personally, for explicit implementations of things, I kind of expect they're going to match existing behavior. But did we consider having this not be explicit? And then there's, you know, then there's be the constructor and create and parse. And it gives us also some like, so there's sort of three top level things and they can have varying behavior. And then we can also have a place to hang the documentation. Yeah. And it also seems Wait. like this is an example where we don't like the existing behavior. So it seems like we would say people like, you know, when in doubt, use parse because you probably get results that you find more predictable. Sorry, I'm not sure I'm following. Is there a cons are we talking about like the constructor that just takes a string? Is that the right? There's a constructor that takes a string that uses absolute. There's try uh, create, which forces you to specify relative or absolute, and then there's this third thing we're talking about. Right. Yeah. Okay. I mean, yeah, I would agree with Stephen. Like, and if we if we make it explicit, then we should pick a behavior. If we want new behavior, I'd rather have them as regular public methods so we can document them. Alternatively, add whatever options we need to the, as overloads to the existing members and then say that it matches that member in that mode. Like we don't have to introduce a third verb or we don't have to have parse, create, and the constructor. We can we can fix try create to to have the allow implicit file paths and and then say this is the same as calling try create with relative or absolute and allow implicit file paths equal false yeah so we did add those overloads right so you can do in your your i string and those options with this flag so you can achieve the same behavior as you would with parse or try parse it's just not the default, right? And it might not be obvious. Uh, I think that's what Simon was getting at, like which behavior you're actually using. And there's no yeah. real good way to put the documentation on, uh, like yeah. unless we actually expose the methods, uh, right. in which case you have to things that do almost the same thing. I would just be things. concerned that once we have both try parse and try create that people aren't going to be, I don't know, good enough to figure out which time they would want parse and which time they want create. Yeah. I mean, that's actually a function of like, you know, what would we tell people? I think if, like, I think of parsing as almost like, you know, without any additional information, what would be the behavior be, right? You just parse a string into a representation of your type, right? Um, which is basically what iParsable does, right? It doesn't allow you to parse in any options. And so I think at that point you could say, well, if that's your goal, then, you know, use parse because, well, it chooses certain options that probably make the most sense for you, right? And avoid uh, pitfalls. And then if you want the very specific behavior, then call the existing APIs and tweak what you actually get out of it. Fair enough. Which I just feel that if we had reasonable. if we had done this first, we would not have called try create try create. We would have overloaded try parse. That's probably true. Yeah, I mean, and arguably that's probably a mistake. I don't know why we didn't call it parse in the first place. Like it seems <laughs> that's what we called it everywhere else. So I mean, it's almost like we just messed up the naming on that type. But that I mean, fortunately in this case, it means we you know the best name is still available, right? And we can give it whatever behavior we want at this point. Yeah, I mean, I because I would be more 
personally more inclined to say we should add a option free overload of create and then alias or do explicit implementation to alias it to create and then just say here's the create with the default options they're probably the ones you want otherwise go call the the one and specify your options yeah i, I do like that honestly um that makes it a little easier to reason about in regard to it matches a public api that overload of try create like you had said And URI doesn't actually care about the provider. It's just required by the interface shape, right? Right. I don't think we can do anything meaningful with that. Yeah. And my recollection with the iParsable is we've done explicit explicit implementation if we don't actually support the iFormat providers. Just to say, this isn't a real option. You shouldn't pass anything here. Yeah, I think you would make those explicit, right? You would just have a, a public version that doesn't take them. Right, and then I'm just saying that should be called try create. Yeah. So ju just so, to confirm for the ASP.NET team, like you, you yeah. do actually want to support relative paths, right? Like you, you have no qualms with what we're discussing here. Yeah, I mean, if you see in the comments, like it's been that way for a while. NBC also yeah. used absolute or relative for URI. Um, for the try create, are we going to add an overload that leaves out the URI kind and defaults to what try parse defaults to? I would prefer to. Yeah, that's that's my recommendation. Yeah, especially if you're going to hide try parse, I think that makes sense. Yeah, I, 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 I like it from the perspective of it kind of gives a more solid footing for this new API to exist. Because I'm, I'm looking for an excuse to give you this API. <laughs> so then, so what's the proposal then? We will have, we will add an API called try create that doesn't take the URI kind uh, and right. just takes basically the string and provides an out for the URI, right? Mm -hmm. Yep. And then we would say, the, what about, uh, do we have a create method today that's false? Uh, no, the constructor. The constructor Which, is the create method. Of course, has the different default for your archive, but I think that's yeah. acceptable. Right. Yeah. Well, you can, there, there are constructor overloads that take the explicit options parameters, just like try yeah. create does. Yeah, that basically means yes. there's no equivalent for URI dot parse with a string and nothing else, right? Um, you would just say, you would have yeah. to say new constructor with the other <laughs> parameters, right? Which is, you know, not as content, but I guess that works. I see. We have try create with no create because the yeah. constructor was create. So we yeah. we would absolutely want to document this because we we now have a discrepancy between the constructors and their corresponding try create overloads but whatever docs yeah I mean, if ASP.NET ends up using this i think in mbc and minimal apis we don't currently use no implicit file paths so that might be well if we decide to use this yeah i mean we don't have to use this um but yeah potentially i mean once it's created it's never changing so yeah. are, are you are you going to end up in a situation where you say, well, if it's URI, ignore iParsable and, and go down the custom logic again? I mean, that's yeah, basically that's what we already do. Um, yeah. But like, we we might have to react because I think we check for the iParsable implementation before we even check if it's URI, just how it's written. And there's a few places we do this, like in type converter and code generators in various places. Yeah, before you do that, I would say let's talk again. Like, I mean, the whole point of adding iParsable is that you can uniformly create, you know, use them, right? So, like, if you find yourself, oh, I can't actually do that, then, well, do we really want to implement iParsable in URI at that point? <laughs> Policy gets in the way, man. I get it, but, like, you know, th th this is the whole thing of, like, saying, you know, you want to treat types uniformly, right? So, if the policy is not usable, then that seems to indicate that there's something wrong with the policy, right? Javier, do you know if we're currently using no implicit file paths anywhere in ASP.NET? 
I so don't, I don't recall. Yeah, you you can't, right? So we haven't actually implemented that flag. Uh, it oh, was oh, I see. Not implemented. Oh, I got you. Okay, I thought it was new, but I wasn't sure how new it was. <laughs> it, yeah, I guess the question would be, would your expected behavior be with or without that flag? And I'm it's guessing scary it would be to change. with that flag, but then. Yeah, like if it was new, I think we'd want that flag. But considering that people have already taken, you know, written actions with URI parameters and stuff. Um, right, but a little it sounds like the, the complicated thing of that feature um, is you'll get different behavior on Windows and Linux. So probably nobody who's using it wants to be using it. The no implicit file paths or the... The default of implicit, like, oh, this looks like a file, uh, change it into file colon colon, because, like, your URI, your relative URI happened to look like a part of your file system. Yeah, I mean, maybe. Like, we could consider the breaking change, because that does seem really bad. I mean, obviously, a lot of people only deploy using one OS, and it might work for them, but yeah. Um, yeah. I think we would take that type of like change because in the end it produces a result that is probably not what you're expecting on Linux. Yeah. This feels it more might secure. Be security. I wasn't about to say. It also seems like a security bug in the process, right? Like, oh yeah, give me arbitrary, you know, files starting from the root. <laughs> it seems like a terrible plan. Yeah. Yeah, I mean, you know. In theory, people could be validating the URI after it's constructed and so forth. Sure, but, yeah. as everybody does all the time, right? Mm -hmm. I mean, I do, but yeah, no, I, I hear you, uh, but not always. All right, are we? So, are we happy with the? We add an overload of try create that removes the extra uh, parameters and has the default of relative or absolute with no implicit file path? I think so. Yeah. Okay, yeah. and then add the interface as aliasing onto that method and parse is doesn't quite map to a method because it maps back to the constructor. That sounds right. Right. Yeah. Can I just clarify one thing? So you, we said parse will do the same, but for a particular constructor overload with specific options. Um, It'll have the same behavior, adding... but it's but new URI of string is already taken, and doesn't do what parse will do. Right, but we're not. We're adding a new constructor here. I'm assuming that this is. It. I've written this down because it sounds like we've previously approved this shape. Like this is a placeholder for a constructed URI options or whatever, um, and uh, but that we haven't actually made it public yet. So this is assuming that we're going to make it public, and then this will be built on the new functionality. What, what? So even if that's what it looks like, why are we differing in terms of the parse versus the try parse? Because we would have also approved the try create that allows you to specify both yeah, relative yeah. or absolute. Right, so the try create 
would also be board. existing. Oh. I'm just saying there's no there's now a try create that doesn't take the options. Right, but why why did we feel we needed to do the new try create method if we were okay delegating to a constructor and specifying specific arguments? Why would we not be okay delegating to a try create and providing specific options, uh, specific arguments? Well, we're hiding try parse, and I think we thought it would be nice to have a. We're also hiding try parse. Yeah. yeah. I mean, we fair. could we could add creative string that does the same thing. I'm not, I'm not suggesting that. I'm, I'm now I'm wondering why did we feel we need the new public method? If we were okay for parse, saying it's okay to delegate to a constructor with a whole bunch of specific arguments, why is it not okay for try parse to do the same? Well, try create didn't have the like one argument version before and URI did, I think is the simple answer. Like we would have added a no, URI. We, the, the issue, the, there is an issue that has been approved that adds a new overload of try create. And based on what you just said, I'm assuming it also adds a new constructor, although I'm not actually positive about that. Um, both, uh, they would allow you to take in some fashion, this no implicit file paths. So right. what's written on the screen, parse is, is delegating to that new constructor, why is it not okay for try parse to also delegate to the new try create overload in that issue? I think it's supposed to, right? I think that's just the typo. It's supposed to go. No, th create. this is what's on the screen right now is a brand new API try create. Yeah. Because well, yeah, but the try parse is supposed to call the brand new try create. Right. And so, no, it's yeah. No, no I think the issue that, that Steven is trying to point out is that we are basically saying we have two APIs. We have try parse and we have parse. And we're basically saying we are hiding both of them. And both of them are delegating to existing functionality. But now it seems like what we are saying is we want a public version of the of the try parse behavior that we call try create, right? But we don't do the same thing for parse. So why are we doing it for one of them but not both of them? Right. Because we don't have a create. So we either yet. do it for we both of them or for neither of them. And sure. the constructor is already taken. But like I know that doesn't feel yeah. good. I mean, I, I kind of lean towards what Steven is saying. I would just say, let's remove the try create overload that we, that we have here. Let's just do try parse and parse as explicit implementations, just delegating. And if we then feel the need to expose one of them, we should expose both of them because it doesn't make sense to just do it for one of them. Okay, so we still feel it should be implicit, but we're going to say try parse should just call try create with those options and we're not going to add the friendlier version of try create. Friendlier meaning fewer I think options. We, I think you're still saying it's explicit, right? So you you don't get to call. Sorry, yeah, yeah. So yeah, we're not. When you do a URI a URI dot, you will not see parse or try parse. You will see Correct. try create, and that's the only. That's the concern there. Yeah. Yeah. You wait until after Levi left. But yeah. I, I think it's okay. We can always add it back later. I think, really yes, tough. Levi wanted a place that the docs would say this is what this does. Right. To be, I, to I mean, be I wanted like that. I, wanted, explicit... I think that's reasonable as well, but I it, there's this weird... I, I didn't understand why we're doing it for half of it and not the other half. Yeah. We did it for and, the half we could. Be, and to be clear, explicit interface implementations are documented. There is a, there's a slot for those already on the docs. So we can't say what the behavior is. It's just that you don't get to, like, the, the thing that is unfortunate about this is that it, because there's a verb that you can't actually say on the public API, it's, it does seem a bit weird that you have to basically do it. Yeah, how do you even call them, I guess? Explicitly? Well, usually using generics, and that's the thing. You, you would never be able to F12 into it, but, yeah, it would probably show up on MSDN or learn.microsoft.com. Uh, if you I mean, for normal type. explicit implementations, you just cast, but what is the equivalent for a static invocation? <laughs> no, usually use generics. I've had to call many of these. It's actually really hard to call with reflection unless you, it's possible, just not easy, um, unless you have like some generic method, like static generic method that you write yourself that then calls the, the static interface method. Right. So in order for me to call these, I hey. have to be in the generic method. I can't do it. In a Pretty much. Method. Hold on, guys. Yeah, yeah. I need to shut down the stream because I am late to a one-on-one. -on -one. Um, so <laughs> thanks, everyone, for joining us. Um, they're probably going to keep talking. Um, same .NET time, same .NET 